Hello, my name is Louise McCluskey and I'm going to present this a lecture on the design of compression members to include the um, This presentation is broken up into three main sections, an introduction followed by an in-depth analysis on the procedure to check the cross-sectional resistance of a compression member, and then also the procedure to check the member blocking resistance of a compression member, and then with the examples at the end of both those sections. So this is part um, one, and in this section, I'm going to be going through the introduction on the cross-sectional resistance um, procedures. Um, so the most common uh, form of compression members are columns, and they are vertical members used to carry axial compression loads. Examples of columns include members within multi-storey buildings used to support floors and roofs, or mass towers used to provide support for cable-stead roof structures. Here's a diagram of a few typical cross sections used for compression members, so circular hollow sections and rectangular hollow sections, and both these have good uh, geometrical properties, um, but their, connection, uh, their connections are expensive and difficult to design. The most common type of uh, cross section used for compre compression members are hot roll sections, and they have large flanges suitable for compression loads, and their open shape means that designing connections is relatively easy. Welded sections are also suitable, but care must be taken to avoid local flange buckling. The type of connections used at the ends of the compression members is important because they can affect the effective length of the member, which is used to work out the resistance of the section to buckling. In practice, the failure of a column is usually related to buckling, which in turn is related to the column's slenderness. Buckling adds an extra bending moment to the axial load and must be carefully checked. The aim of column design is to predict the load at which a column may buckle and make sure that there is an adequate factor of safety compared to the applied load. As indicated on the diagram, very stocky compression members behave the same as tension members, but unlike tension members whose resistance is independent of its length, the length of a compression member has a significant effect on the resistance of the member. Long slender members will be more likely to buckle and therefore fail earlier than a very stocky compression member which will feel by squashing. This decrease in resistance of the compression member is due to the fact that when it load when the load N is applied it will cause um bending in a member which already has initial curvature as indicated on the diagram by the dashed line. This bending will be more noticeable in slender columns and therefore an increase in length means a decrease in the resistance of the compression member. The behaviour of a column will depend on its slenderness as I already showed you in the diagram a few slides back, stocky columns are not susceptible to buckling and instead fail in the squash load is reached. Um, columns with high slenderness fail by elastic buckling, and columns with the medium slenderness are sensitive to the effects of imperfections and fail by inelastic buckling. So now we're going to talk about elastic buckling theory. Here is the expression for the Euler critical load NCR. This provides a measure of the slenderness of a compression member. EI is the flexural rigidity of the compression member. To get the Euler critical stress, we divide the Euler load over the area on which it acts, and we get this expression at the bottom. I should point out that the critical stress is not related to the strength of the material, but rather the stiffness E. Now the radius of gyration is related is equal to the square root of the sac moment of area over the area, and the slenderness lambda bar is equal to a critical length over the radius of duration, so we substitute the values of i, a and the critical length with the slenderness ratio um, lambda bar, and this is the expression that you get. Since the slenderness ratio is squared, a small increase in its value can affect the value of Euler stress significantly. And since the slenderness ratio is based on the radius of duration and the critical length, the next parameters can both greatly affect the Euler critical load. In the previous slide, um, I introduced you to this term lambda bar, which is the slenderness ratio, and here's a graph of it plotted against the Euler stress. As you can see from the graph, the larger the slenderness ratio, then the smaller the Euler stress will be, and in turn, the smaller the value of the collapse load in CR, of the Euler collapse load. So if we're looking to withstand a large collapse load, then we need to have a low slenderness ratio. Now, Column is considered stocky when its slenderness lambda bar is less than 0.2, and it will not be affected by buckling. Instead, the strength of the column is related to the material strength. Therefore, the maximum compression resistance, Nmax, is equal to the plastic resistance of the cross-section, Npl, and that's equal to the effective area of the cross-section, 
times the yield strength. So now here's a summary of the types of failure that would occur in columns of different slenderness. So for columns of extremely low slenderness, so stocky columns, the failure will depend on the material strength. For slender columns, the failure will depend on the Euler stress. And for intermediate columns, which fall between both categories, their failure will depend on both the material strength and the Euler stress. Out of straightness and residual stresses are the imperfections which have the most significant effect on the behaviour of this kind of column. So far, the material that we have gone through has assumed that we are dealing with perfect columns, but in reality, most columns will feel by inelastic buckling before reaching the Euler load. The difference in real and theoretical behaviour is mainly due to imperfections in the real element. Examples of imperfections include initial out of straightness, residual stresses, eccentricity of applied loads, and strain hardening. All of those imperfections will affect the buckling behaviour of the column. Euler's theory makes no allowances for the homogeneity or the isotropy of the column material. It does not allow for a variation in the Young's modulus. Does not consider local buckling and can only be used for rectangular sections. So here we have a problem, since most columns that we will be dealing with touch upon one or more of these categories. Now, as I said um, a few slides back, the difference in real and theoretical behaviour is due to various imperfections in the real element. So here is a list of some common imperfections. So there are geometric imperfections, so a section could have initial curvature, the column might be eccentricity loaded and the section may be affected by residual stresses caused by welding or hot rolling. So residual stresses can be distributed in various ways across the section. The stress pattern produced by hot rolling is shown on the right hand side here. And then the stress pattern produced by welding is also shown on the right hand side. So in order to take into account the various imperfections which the Euler formula doesn't allow for, Eurocode 3 uses the Perry Robertson approach. Now, Perry observed that all columns contain imperfections and will deflect laterally from the onset of loading, that the maximum stress along the column length occurs at mid height and on the inner surface, and that the maximum stress will comprise of two components, so it will comprise of axial stress and bending stress. And Perry also observed that failure may be assumed when the maximum stress reaches yield. Robertson contributed that the bending stress component is a function of the lateral deflection, which is, in turn, an amplification of the initial imperfection, and Robertson determined suitable values for these initial imperfections for a range of structural cross-sections, so five different imperfection amplitudes are included through the imperfection factor alpha, giving us five buckling curves. So now that we've covered the theory, here is a summary of the design checks that we will need to consider when designing com a compression member to Eurocode 3. So for a slender column where lambda bar is greater than 0.2, we will need to check both the cross-section resistance and the buckling resistance. Clause 6312 part 4 states that the buckling effects may be ignored for stocky columns, therefore we will only need to carry out a cross-section cross resistance check. So this section will deal with the first check that we have to carry out, and that's for cross-section resistance. So to do this, uh, so we need to do this for both slender and stocky columns. To make sure the resistance of the cross-section is adequate, the following equation must be satisfied. So NED divided by NCRD must be less than or equal to 1. This is expression 6-9. What is telling us is that the, the design compression force NED must be less than the cross-section compression resistance NCRD. Now the cross-section resistance depends on the cross-section classification, so for class 1, 2 and 3 sections we use expression 610, so that's equal to the gross area times the yield strength over gamma m naught. For class 4 sections we use expression 611, where the effective area times the yield strength over gamma m naught, and gamma m naught is equal to 1, and that's the case for both the core Euroco document and the UK National Annex. So these are the design steps required to classify a section and they're covered in great detail in the cross-section classification e-lecture. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. First of all, we need to determine FY and the UK National Annex tells us that we get that from the product standards. Once we have FY, we can get epsilon from the bottom of table 5.2 and then using the limits in table 5.2, we can work out the class of the web in flange. The overall class then will be the least favorable between the web and the flange. 
So that's just a very brief summary just to remind you on how to classify a section using your code three. So now here is a summary of the design steps required to work out the cross section resistance. And first of all, we need to work out the design compression force. Then we need to choose a section and classify it. For classes 1, 2 and 3, the design compression resistance is equal to the gross area times the yield strength over gamma m0. And for class 4 sections, it's the effective area times the yield strength over gamma m0. So now we've got the value of the design compression resistance, we can compare that to the design compression force in step 4. So that's just a brief summary showing you the main design steps that you will use. So we have covered the design step to find cross-sectional resistance of a compression member, and now I'm going to go through an example. So here we have a 254 times 254 times 73 UC in grade SV55 steel, and we need to determine the compression resistance. So here's a list of some of the terms that we might need. So the height, breadth, the wave and flange thicknesses, the root radius, and the, the area of the section. So we already have been given our section, and now we need to classify it, and we need to get the value of the yield strength FY. Now, the UK National Annex will tell us to refer to the product standards, so here's Table 7 from EN 10025-2. We can see that the largest thickness, which is the flange thickness, TF, is 14.2mm. In Table 7, there are several thickness limits, but for this example, it's clear that 14.2 is less than 16. We know that the grade of steel is S355, and we read across then, we get a value for FY, yield strength, yield strength and that's equal to 355 newtons per millimetre squared. So now that we know the yield strength is 355 newtons per millimetre squared, we can read the value of epsilon from the bottom of table 5.2, and that gives us a value 0.81 for epsilon. Now first of all, we're going to deal with outstand land, which is on sheet 2 of table 5.2. We have to determine the width to thickness ratio, and for that we need the value of C, so we use this expression C equals B minus TW minus 2R all over 2 which is slightly larger than the capital B over W, which you would have used in BS5950. So substituting in the value, if we get C equal to 110.3, we divide that by the flange thickness TF, which is 14.2, and we get 7.77. The class 1 limit for the flange of the uniform compression is 9 epsilon. That's equal to 7.29. Since the width to thickness ratio is greater than the class 1 limit, we know that the this set that is not class 1. So next we need to try the limit for class 2, and that's 10 epsilon, which is equal to 8.1. So the width to thickness ratio is less than the class 2 limit, therefore we know that it's class 2. So we just need to do the same thing for the internal compression part, so the web. Here C is equal to H minus 2TF minus 2R, so that's the same as you would have used in BS5950. So C is equal to 200.3 millimetres. We divide that by the web thickness TW, which is 8.6, and we get 23.9. The class 1 limits for web and compression is 33 epsilon, which is equal to 26.73. Therefore, the web is class 1. The overall class of this action is the highest class between the flange and the web. In this case, the flange is class 2 and the web is class 1. Therefore, the overall class of this action is the highest class, which is class 2. So now that we know the yield strength and the section class, we can then go on to work out the cross-sectional compression resistance. The expression that we use to work out the cross-sectional resistance to compression will depend on the section class. So we have worked out that the overall class of the section is class 2, so we will use this top expression, which is equation 16 in your code. We know um, the area, because we have listed that at the start of the problem, and that is the section property. And we have determined that the yield strength is 355 newtons per millimetre squared, and we know the partial safety factor gamma m0 is from the UK National Annex, and that's equal to 1. So all we need to do is to substitute in the values. So putting in the values, we get a cross-section compression resistance of 3,305 kilonewtons. So that's um, all of the steps completed. If we had been given a design compression force, Um, if we'd been given a design compression force, um, we would have went on to compare that value to the resistance and made sure that the resistance was greater than the design force. In the next few slides, then, I'm going to run through the same problem using Master Space Software and we can then compare the results.
So now to go through the example maths tree, so I've made sure to select your code for your design code option and then put our section for us to 254 times 254 times 73 UC and create S355 steel. So we have selected our section and we want to know what class it is, so we can simply choose section properties and classification option from the elements design menu and this is output that you get. So you can see here it circles class 2 and that's the same as we worked out by hand. Now we want to find out the cross section resistance to compression, so we choose the compression resistance option from the elements design menu. And this is a screenshot of the results that we get. So if you look at where I circled, you can see that the compression resistance is 3305.05 kilonewtons. And that's the same answer that we got from the hand calculation. So this example will conclude part one of the lecture on compression members. Thank you for listening.